The chief of the Cowessess First Nation in Saskatchewan describes it as a crime scene, another grave site on the grounds of a former residential school, this one containing the remains of hundreds of people, the resting places all unmarked. Cadmus Delorme spoke of the discovery at a virtual news conference last hour. We started our radar penetrating research on June the 2nd of 2021. As of yesterday, we have hit 751 unmarked graves. This is not a mass grave site. These are unmarked graves. Over the past years, the oral stories of our elders, of our survivors, and friends of our survivors have told the stories that knew these burials were here. In 1960, there may have been marks on these graves. The Catholic Church representatives removed these headstones, and today they are unmarked graves. I'm 80 years old. And I went to boarding school down there. I, I was uh, taken by my parents to go. At that time, if uh, the parents didn't want to uh, allow their children to, to go to boarding school, one of them had to go to jail. So in order that we keep the, the family together, we went to boarding school. They brought us there. We stayed there. And we learned... They, they pounded it into us. And really, they were very mean. When I say pounding, I mean pounding. Those nuns were very mean to us. For, I don't know, I don't think they liked, liked it being there either. They told us our, our, um, our people, our parents and grandparents had no... Um, um, they, they didn't have a way to be spiritual because we were all heathens. So they were putting us down as a people. So we learned how to not like who we were. That elder, Florence Sparvier, said she is the third generation that attended the school following her mother and grandmother. She says they were all told they had no souls and struggled with the pain in the aftermath. Let's talk with Pam Palmiter now. She's a Mi'kmaq lawyer, professor, and chair of Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. And we want to warn our viewers again, some of you may find parts of the conversation disturbing. Uh, Pam, is it, is it too late to learn from these discoveries? No, I, I don't think it is. I think this should have been out in the open. I think Canadians should have been taught this in schools. I think, you know, Canada has should have done public education a long time ago. But uh, because it hasn't, now it's these little children whose unmarked graves are that are going to be the teachers. And it's the First Nations who are taking it upon themselves to locate their children because governments and churches have failed to do so. And I think Canadians need to understand that as well, that this is a struggle to even get the truth out there. Are you, I don't want to, I'll let you find the words. I was going to say, are you disappointed that we have known, we've, we've known that there are thousands of children in these unmarked graves. We've known that for years. It, well, it came out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But this groundbreaking uh, radar technology, this new technology is being able to kind of, you know, offer even more proof, if you will, or technological proof, if you will, that there are remains, there are bodies, there are children in these, in the, in these sites. Is it disappointing to you that, that it's taken that? for people to kind of seem to wake up or or how do you feel about it I do I'm I'm exceptionally angry and like infuriated at church officials and governments because many of these sites have been known for generations. These are sites that, I mean, they had lists of here's where we know there's unmarked graves. Here's where we know that there's burials. Here's where some children were forced to bury their own classmates in the backyard of these residential schools. And communities have been asking, families have been asking, 
take the steps, release all of the documents, churches and governments, and use resources to identify, locate these children and bring them home. And they've all failed to do that. So yes, it's it's very angering because what it does is it extends the trauma of all of these families, all of these First Nations who have to keep wondering, have to keep waiting. And then as it slowly rolls out, because they knew where it was, with or without new technology, Mm -hmm. they could have located those children had records been shared. What about those records? Are you concerned that they won't be released, that they've been destroyed, that we won't know who these children are? Exactly. I'm concerned about all of that because we know the federal government uh, hasn't been disclosing all of the records. We know that because they're fighting St. Anne's residential school survivors in court right now to withhold records that are evidence of the abuse. And keep in mind, St. Anne's had the electric chair. And then churches, we know the Catholic Church is infamous for destroying records, withholding records, um, even in court proceedings in other places around the world, most notably Boston in the United States. And so, uh, you know, I have a real hard time that the that the longer the government waits to force the church to release those records by whatever means necessary, including legal proceedings, and its own failure to release records means that they could be forever destroyed and we not might might not be able to identify every children in every location of graves. And that would just be repeating the injustice to Indigenous people. Pam, why, why, why? <laughs> Have they not, the Catholic Church, been compelled, compelled by law with police going in and taking these documents? How has that not happened? Well, I mean, if we lived in a country that was about following its own laws, Native people would have been able to call up the RCMP and say, hey, the federal government isn't releasing these records. Can you go get them? And the churches aren't releasing these records of crimes that have been committed can you go get those records? I mean, that's what you do when crimes have been committed. We're talking about all of the murders and manslaughter, physical and sexual abuse, medical experimentation and torture in those schools. There's more than enough legal justification to go in and get those records. And so there's a lot of like finger pointing back and forth, but they're all responsible for not going and getting these records and allowing this cover up or erasure of our history to happen. And so we're not going to get to a spot of reconciliation until Canadians know everything, the full scope of the atrocity. Is this a moment where Canadians are thinking, looking and saying, give these records over, release these records? Yes. I mean, I really see this as a moment because Canadians have been outraged over the last month of the federal government fighting these residential school survivors in court, fighting First Nation kids in foster care in court, refusing to compensate them, refusing to follow their own laws. And now with the discovery of the graves in Kamloops and now here in Cowessis, I mean, Canadians are starting to see uh, on a multitude of levels all of the parties that are not only culprits in what happened, but are the ones now that are the barriers to moving forward, the mm-hmm. barriers to justice. We have to end that. Now, the uh, and I want to get this right, but the NDP government in British Columbia has, f- a- and um, the Catholic order that was uh, responsible for the, uh, the Kamloops Residential School, there is going to be some kind of uh, release. How do you? How would you characterize that? And is that a good first step? Well, I, I hope there's going to be a release of all of the documents. That none of the documents have been destroyed or shipped overseas, where we can't access them in their so-called secret files. Um, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, I'm. I'm not. confident that that'll be the case, but of course time will tell. But we we have to make sure that all of the documents, no matter where they're located, here in Canada or overseas or in museums or libraries or archives, provinces, federal government, they all have to be released. What are you hearing from elders and other members of Indigenous communities? Uh, A a lot of uh, sadness, obviously, um, but also a lot of caring for one another. So I've, you know, heard from elders who are actually, you know, despite all the trauma that they went through, 
making sure that they're there for everybody else who is really having a, a hard time because there's the survivors who survived residential schools, but then there's the families of children who never survive and they don't know where their children are and they don't know what they died from. And it's just impossible to get closure or move towards healing in that scenario. And then there's elders who are reminding everyone that what happened in residential schools hasn't stopped, that the foster care system replicates that. There's murdered and missing Indigenous women, there's over-incarceration. So Canada's institutionalization of Indigenous peoples hasn't stopped, and it has to stop in order for us to be able to not only reconcile what happened in the past, but to make sure that we don't keep doing this in the future. What about the Pope? Oh my goodness, well, I mean, you would think uh, any religion in the world, any spirituality, any belief that's based on goodness, that there would be a moral responsibility to stand up and say, this was a horrific set of crimes that were committed by people under our responsibility. And we're going to take moral and legal responsibility for that and hold ourselves to account and make reparations and do whatever is necessary to bring about justice and healing for Indigenous peoples. Anything less than that is just another injustice committed against these survivors. And maybe, I'm sorry, maybe an apology? Yeah, well, an apology that comes with action. Mm -hmm. Because much like federal governments, I mean, Canada's allegedly apologized for residential schools, yet they're fighting residential school survivors in court. So we've right. got to match apologies with action and i think for many of the survivors who are still part of the catholic religion to hear that kind of apology would also help in their healing process and what about the the fact that in this case the there were graves there there were headstones there and they were removed and so what well, does that say so think about all of the levels multiple and com complex levels of criminality here. So you have graves that were known, they were marked, and then removed. For what purpose do you do that other than to cover up what's happened, erase what's happened? You combine that with all of the crimes that were committed in residential schools, and then the crimes of not reporting those crimes and withholding documents, and now removing those headstones. That is a purposeful, intentional, cover up or erasure of what happened. It's trying to hide from responsibility. And that is literally the opposite of what should have happened. And of course, we're never going to get to reconciliation until we hold ourselves to account, everybody that's been involved in this. This is a difficult conversation for a lot of Canadians. I think they find it difficult to hear. Maybe, maybe you're frustrated by that. Uh, Maybe this is a moment. Maybe this is a time where Canadians are, are, are listening. For those non-Indigenous Canadians who are listening, what is your message to them about next steps in this conversation, in this, uh, in this moment in our history? Well, for all of those who didn't know what happened, um, now you know. So what are you going to do to ensure that your governments, your church, or anybody who's involved in all of these crimes and atrocities and the cover-up are brought to justice? There's, you know, Canada identified over 5,300 perpetrators. What are we doing to bring these people to account? And Canadians are a powerful force. Governments listen to their electorate when they all are speaking against these issues. And so Canadians need to step up and say, this is wrong. So um, imagine how terrible Canadians are feeling to hear this. Imagine for Indigenous peoples going through that. So if they can only imagine that this happened to their family, imagine that outside of their children's school, there was graves of like, two, three, four hundred people. I mean, that just would never happen. So if you only put yourselves in the shoes of First Nations for one minute and say, what do I have to offer to bring forth justice? And that is putting pressure on governments for sure. Pam, always appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pam Palmeter in Toronto. She is chair of Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University.